let's get started. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the first colloquium of the semester. Uh, let's thank our organizers, which is not me, but Nestle uh, Young and I'm playing for um, so it's really my pleasure to welcome Dr. Cassandra Cass Jacobs, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Linguistics at the University of Buffalo, uh, where they run the Computational Linguistics and Cognition Lab, the acronym is CALICO, and I invite you to check out their mascot, <laughs> it's really cute. Um, they are particularly interested in the role of learning and memory in language production. Prior to joining Buffalo Linguistics in 2021, they were a postdoctoral scholar at the University of Wisconsin. And after receiving their PhD in psychology at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, they worked for two years as a data scientist working with natural language processing as stitch fix. And nowadays they apply machine learning and natural language processing tools to better understand the cognitive processes that support human language processing in the lab and corpus data. Uh, Dr. Jacobs is actually for me, a great example of a scholar who thinks deeply about the broader impact that our research and community practices can have. Uh, for example, they have published on the effect of conference travel on the current climate crisis and um, the importance of access to virtual conferencing. And more recently, they have authored a critical blog post on the negative consequences of incorporating closed for profit computational models like ChatGPT uh, in our psycholinguistic practices. Um, and um, we can hear about how complex and competition was in language production. So join me once again in my <laughs> I can't believe Agnello doesn't want to do the rest of the hour and a half of this. Um, <laughs> it's really nice to be here. Uh, I really like being in Utah. I think it's really great. The vibes are great. The autumn colors and the mountains, uh, sun, very much appreciated coming from Buffalo. Um, okay, great. Y'all can hear me? <clears throat> okay, so um, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about how context and competition constrain language production. And I want to start you out with, a, with an example that I hope doesn't strike fear into your heart. Um, I apparently mildly traumatized my partner's uh, senior graduate student by showing her this picture because the full context they had just seen the movie The Rabbit, uh, which is apparently like some kind of my it was some awful music video or something. It, it was a very, very upsetting experience for them. So they were very sad to see this picture presented on my slides. But I want you to try and think about it. how would you describe this picture? What would you say that this is a picture of? Okay. Yeah, you could do you could do so many different things, right? You could think you could this is in you could go infinitely long in your description of this picture. I will show you what I eventually said, but in order to do this to solve this problem, I said shout time. I posted this to Instagram because this is the bunny who was in my yard. Um, uh, there were uh, so many things that I had to do to coordinate to be able to say this is what I wanted to caption in this picture on Instagram ads. So first of all, I have to know what this thing is. It's a bunny. Uh, I live in North America, so it's a particular kind of bunny. He's eating a uh, daisy fleabane, which is like a really weirdly named flower plant thing. He just ate this whole thing in like 10 seconds. I also have to know so things about like what, what is happening to me right now, episodic memory, semantic memory, what are bunnies, what do they do? Uh, also, I have to look at things and hear things and otherwise process lots of sensory information in order to produce an utterance. And then eventually, I have to use the motor system to do this, right? Like, I cannot produce an utterance without engaging the motor system, whether I'm typing or texting or signing or singing or anything like that. Now, these are just, just generic cognitive systems that are involved in language production, but language production is also really sensitive to linguistic factors, thankfully. And so, among other things, it's sensitive to the statistical structure of the languages that we know. So things about chow time is a particular kind of expression that one can use, right? That we use sort of as a humorous effect, mostly, hopefully. Um, but I also am sensitive not just to that, but what has been said, what could be said. So I'm interested in trying to figure out how those things combine. So the first kind of the way that I'm going to work through this talk is I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how experience, the statistical knowledge of language, 
shapes language production. So what are the things that you need to integrate in order to successfully produce multi-word combinations? Then I'll talk to you a little bit about context and what, what role the surrounding words in our utterances actually play in the word choice that we make. Then I'll show you about how our production is actually really finely sensitive to other things that we could say. So both our speed and uh, our specific decisions will change based on you know, what all, all of our alter alternatives are. And then I'm gonna show you kind of a sketch of a really high level model of production here that is essentially a Bayesian hierarchical model of word choice. Um, and the motivation here is that hopefully we can get to slightly less computationally expensive uh, processes because we have to speak really quickly. We cannot make as many decisions as the entire vocabulary and we certainly can't make infinite possible computations at any one point in time. So how do we do it? To study the role of uh, just all the factors in language production, experience was kind of where I entered into this. So this is, um, I'm going to be summarizing a little bit of my dissertation work, which is now seven years old, um, but I think really strongly informs the way that I think about these problems. So the statistics of language, regardless of how you feel about them, affect our processing fluency. So this includes things like, do the words that I'm about to say sound like other words? Are they phonologically similar to the patterns of sounds that occur in my language. Um, so phonological properties affect the production of my words. Likewise, word frequency is a really strong predictor of how quickly and accurately we are able to name pictures or uh, describe things. And then more recently, there was a kind of, this is the early precursor to a lot of the newer statistical uh, sort of computational psycholinguistics that's been out. Um, where people had identified that frequent combinations of words really, really impact processing fluency. So for example, Bannard and Matthews showed that children are better at repeating forward sequences that are familiar sequences like sip of milk than rather than sip of tea. Um, children still prefer to drink milk than tea in the UK. Um, then Ar Arnon and Snyder actually showed a similar kind of effect that people have an intuitive understanding of what thing of what a phrase looks like. So a combination of words, um, you can show them uh, sequences of words that are either arbitrary or familiar, and they're much faster to identify the familiar ones, and they're faster to identify the familiar ones to the extent that they are frequent. Right. So the more frequent a combination is, like say, um, alcoholic beverages or something like that, people will be fast to make that decision. This shows up in production. It shows up in the durations of the things that we pronounce. Um, so this influences production at very, very, very strong levels, but it doesn't tell us like, why the heck do you even get these kinds of effects? Like, where is this stored in the brain? And so um, my, my early work was really interested in like, well, okay, you have to aggregate across a lot of experiences to arrive at, an, at knowledge. So, maybe individual episodes or individual experiences actually can come together to allow you to produce combinations of words fluently. So I don't know if you guys are the types of people to watch like daytime television. So I'm gonna assume you probably aren't, um, but the example I'm gonna stick with here for is called psychic, I'm gonna use the term psychic nephew, right? Which is something that's pre reasonably common um, in my studies and nowhere else, right? So psychic nephew, uh, it could just be like some some nephew of yours who's psychic, right? It could be somebody else's nephew who's psychic. Um, this is in, in contrast to probably more familiar instances of the word, like favorite nephew. And hopefully you don't have a favorite nephew. Hopefully you love them all equally. But you have lots of memories of the word psychic and the word nephew. And unless you've been a real big fan of this kind of literature, pretty much today is the only time you've ever heard this phrase. Right, and that's just the kind of question here. Each of those stars is kind of a proxy for all the memories that you have associated with the word psychic and all the memories you have associated with the word nephew. Right? So kind of follow me with the, the, the graphic the depiction of this problem here. Um, what's interesting about this? This is a Venn diagram. So it suggests that there's a sort of intersection of memories that we have between psychic and nephew. There's a conjunction that we have to do to stick those two together. So, what does that mean? Uh, so there's two general sort of theories, one of which posits that uh, word frequency or word representations encode the, the phrase information in them, right? So my memory of psychic is partly influenced by the fact that it occurred with nephew, and so it's in this intersection. Another option could be, well, let's pretend that 
none, there's no such Venn diagram at all. And we actually just have separate me me memories. And I would have like a star all the way over here, like a little red star that's just psychic nephew conjunctions. And then I would imagine that psychic and nephew have their own separate memories. Those could be decomposed representations or they could be holistic ones. And I'm gonna try and argue that there's that's a false dichotomy. Um, so theories of episodic memory in particular posit that we have really intricate memories of all of the things that we've ever experienced. And I'm talking like down to, did this occur on a blue background versus a green background kind of stuff, really, really fine grain detail. Um, and some of the accounts of the phrase frequency, or, uh, word frequency processing effects actually basically say that you store every single instance you've ever seen of the word psychic and nephew. And then when you have to say, oh yeah, I, I, you know, that was the, one of the words that got used in this lecture that Dr. Jacobs used today, um, you would basically go through and search all of your memories of each of those individual words. And um, the argument that we do this better for uh, some kinds of words over others comes from the fact that low frequency words are much easier to recognize than high frequency words. And you probably intuitively experience this on like a multiple choice test, where if you have an answer that stands out, you're like, oh yeah, that definitely wasn't in the book, or that was definitely in lecture. Right. So the same idea applies here. Um, we basically want to see, do we actually see memory benefits for uh, phrases that have different types of statistical properties? And so again, one possibility is that holistic phrases could just be retrieved as if they were individual words, like they just are their own little episodic stars in this big floating universe of our memories. Or um, they could actually be composed of like links between individual elements, right? So maybe we have memories of psychic and memories of nephew and they somehow make each other stronger. So we're basically trying to get at the question of like, where is this little star? Um, is the star in an intersection like this or is it basically all the way out in the periphery? So for this, uh, we did a free recall task. Um, have y'all ever had to do like a psychology study where you, somebody made you do this? So you get sit you sit in front of a computer screen and somebody flashes stuff at you for like five minutes and then you're given a piece of paper and you have to write down as much as you possibly can. Um, and most of the time you don't remember that much at all. Right, that is the sad reality of these types of studies. Um, I designed a whole bunch of stimuli uh, in various experiments with different types of properties, all of which had an adjective noun phrases. So they're not you know compounds, they're not necessarily things that are not literal. Uh, but they are varyingly degrees of idiomatic. So like poor credit, for example, or impossible dream. These are examples of phrases that I used in my study that were lower frequency, less familiar. Um, on the other hand, some of the higher frequency ones were like social network, wrong direction, regular basis. So they have a pretty high degree of idiomaticity, but are also all reasonably compositional, right? Like you can interpret all of these without needing to like to go through memory and be like, ah, this is a non-literal use of the word direction or something. Um, so in these experiments, people get these lists of adjective noun phrases. You can present them in any number of ways and you basically get the same general effects, but we ask people to either recall the individual words from these phrases or recall the phrases directly on paper without time pressure. Um, and uh, we basically looked at their recall of their, uh, of their phrases in two ways. Um, this is gonna take a minute, so it's gonna take a second. Um, we use what we call the multinomial recall procedure. And so what this means is that we're breaking down recall of phrases into two stages. The first one is that you could initiate recall. So you could say, I remember, you know, poor. And then the other one could be, do you also remember credit if you remember the word poor, right? So if you initiate, then this is associated with this parameter P, that was just because we wanted to use familiar letters that people love. And then um, if you completed it and you also remembered credit, then you would get an extra uh, mark according to Q, right? So each person can either remember one word or both words of the phrase. And remembering both words is conditioned on remembering the first one, right? Because you can't remember two without remembering one, right? So uh, we had basically argued that holistic processing basically says that phrase frequency doesn't really impact either of these uh, uh, either of these parameters because we know that for words, uh, word frequency doesn't really matter for recall, 
Um, it's an interesting dichotomy because you would imagine like in many other cases, word frequency is very important for production. But if phrases are just like individual words, we expect to see the same kind of midi, mid middling kind of result. On the other hand, if there's something going on between P and Q, like let's say you go back and you have episodic memories in which psychic is associated with this little guy and nephew is associated with this little guy, you can use these two words as cues to remember both of the words. Um, that's only going to exist insofar as these words share some degree of uh, representation, some uh, episodic overlap. And um, this other proposal is that basically we resynthesize our memories on the basis of using those convergent cues. So um, it basically predicts the phrase frequency does matter, but only for completion, because we don't have, you're not retrieving phrases, you're retrieving individual words. Okay. Um, so what we do here, uh, I'm going to show you this P parameter, which is the initiation of a uh, phrase recall. And what you can see is that if we plot a uh, phrase frequency on the x-axis, this is as determined by corpora. I basically gathered up the frequencies and number of counts of each of these phrases. Recall doesn't really change as a function of phrase frequency. Like you're as likely to remember the word poor as the word credit, as the word poor credit, and so on. Like just for initiating your, your memory. On the other hand, if we get to completing the recall, um, if you have retrieved the word poor or credit, um, you're a little bit less likely to recall the other word. So if you get poor, you might not you might not get credit. And if you get credit, you might not get poor. But if you get, I know that I should I should be able to do this because it's a memory task, right? But I'm in my mid thirties now, my memory's worse. Um, if you have one of the highest frequency phrases that I can't recall right now, if you get one of those words, which if I could get it, I would recall the other one. I would remember both of them. Mm -hmm. So higher frequency words, higher frequency phrases contain elements that boost each other in memory. Um, so here's here's the here's the account. Um, let's say that you have a lexicon, uh, all the words that you know in memory, you have some degree of association between those two words in memory. So if I have the word sad pug, right, uh, and big and cat, those are phrases that exist in my memory. Um, you can also have sad cats. Um, I don't have any big pug memories. And the pugs are not particularly large. So I have a lexicon, uh, that's uh, kind of this bottom layer of one of these, uh, circles and lines kind of psychological graphs. And then these are all linked to a bunch of numbered episodes. <laughs> this is just the idea here that we have individual memories associated with each linguistic construct that we've seen, and they're associated to, say, points in time. Um, maybe I remember that I was at a particular restaurant on the coast of California, and I was eating something, and then I saw a big cat, right? Um, oh, those aren't supposed to be here. The cats don't like water. And then I would map that onto this point in time and I would make some association strength with those. The important part is that this link here between big and cat is partially encoded in the number of links that exist also to episodes. So if I can re retrieve, say, in a laboratory context, that I am kind of roughly in this like kind of beigey space, I can say, okay, well, what things are connected to this beigey space and time. And I could possibly retrieve sad pug, right? Um, but sad pug itself has a pretty weak interconnection. So if I get the word sad, let's say that I have this memory of time, and I, mean, I know what time it is in this study, right? I'm like, what stuff have I re experienced recently? If I get pug, I'm like, uh, well, I just have pug, right? I can't really cross this little bridge to get sad. Um, if I get sad, but I can also kind of be like, okay, well, I could try and get other words, but I might just get big, I might get pug, but probably not. Um, on the other hand, at the same point in time, more or less, if I get the word big, I can start to search through other things that are connected to big. And big is very strongly connected to cat. So if I get those two things together, I can then verify is my memory of cat also tied to this particular point in time. And if these two things are tied to the same point in time, this is what's doing the phrase memories. This is where all the phrases are living. So phrases are not necessarily a thing in memory. Rather, it's the conjunction of those two events at some particular temporal point that allows us to get this effect. Um, 
Okay, I realized that uh, this might have been a lot. Uh, when I went through this earlier, I was like, oh yeah, of course I'm correct. Uh, so please let me hope I can go through, go through this again. But what I want to emphasize here is that the biggest challenge for language production is explaining what knowledge we're actually bringing online, right? And, and I think that the way that we can explain the fact that people's memory for phrases is sensitive to completion. The completion of our phrase memory is dependent on phrase frequency, is basically a, a product of these association strengths associated between words that are used to verify some temporal uh, knowledge, right? So did I experience these things at approximately the same time? So each of these individual words is tied to a memory, but the conjunction of those is not explicitly represented. Um, this strength is really the thing that mediates the activation that allows us to verify if we saw those two things or not. So do I believe phrases exist? Sort of. Uh, so phrases, uh, I basically think of them now as a combination of convergent cues. Um, but the reason that they're easier to produce is precisely just because they tend to occur together in time. But the representation of the phrase is not exactly distinct from that temporal representation. So holistic representations are actually only uh, needed to be encoded in terms of like just pure association between those words. That's not necessarily something that has to look like a phrase frequency. Like that could be, you could also get the same effect here with uh, pug and cat, for example, might have a strong association because they're both animals that you could have at home. Um, so in general, I think this, this the high level thing that this, brought me to, is that fluent production is supported by interconnections throughout the lexicon. So the way that we ultimately are able to produce things quickly is because we use all this knowledge to drive our forward uh, predictions of what we're going to say. So how do we actually pick what we're going to say? So we're going back to this, this uh, image here. Some of y'all said rabbit, and some of y'all said bunny. There's probably other kinds of kinds of words you could tell us. Like maybe you don't, you know, maybe English isn't your first language and you come up with that word first. Um, this is a huge constraint problem, right? So for the second so, uh, sort of part of this talk, I want to talk about the role of context. Um, and I'm particularly interested in these kinds of alternations between different uh, word forms that are pretty closely related but encode slightly different meanings. So Let's say that you have uh, these these two words, chimp and chimpanzee, right? Um, intuitively, you might be like, okay, yeah, those are those are talking about the same thing, but also chimpanzee sounds like a little fancy, like it sounds like a little bit more like, oh, like I'm in an anthropology lecture, right? And like, you know, as opposed to like if you were at the zoo and somebody was like, oh wow, look at the chimps, right? Like if somebody said, if you had like a three year old child and they said, look at the chimpanzee, you might be like, you read a book a lot. Right. Um, kids are going to say chimp, you know, chimpanzee is kind of a hoity hoity kind of word. Uh, and this, this applies to like all kinds of words like this in English, right? So info, information, um, quad, like the university quad versus quadrangle. Um, if you walked around saying like, where's the quadrangle on your campus? Somebody would be like, <laughs> a little puzzled. Um, and it's that kind of distinction in the context in which we use these words that actually raises a big question for me, which is, where do we get all these kind of sociolinguistic kind of contextual sources of information converging on our choices? So this project is sort of also partly like a, a response to a proposal that people basically just pick the shorter word when the word is more predictable. So imagine you're a child and you're like, ah, oh, okay, do I say chimp or chimpanzee? And then it's like, well, chimp is really predictable in this context. Uh, so I'm going to say the shorter word, right? I'm going to, we're talking about chimpanzees. I'm at the zoo. I don't have to say chimpanzee. Um, that seems a little awkward. So we're gonna actually explicitly test this, test this account. Um, I basically massively expanded a study that a lot of people really like um, because it shows this really kind of intuitive, like, oh yeah, of course, like if it's predictable, you can say less, right? Um, but uh, sort of confounded with the discourse context in which we produce these words. So I wanted to explicitly test that. We kind of came up with this schematic uh, in which we have contextual factors. So these are non-linguistic necessarily. These could be things like the preceding words, the identities of the preceding words. But they could also be, you know, um, like, am I hungry? Is the weather bad? Like, do I need to yell? Uh, do I need to be extremely, you know, 
careful about who can hear me and what my message should sound like. And I also have to say something, right? I also have to convey an idea. And where I end up on the spectrum between chimp and chimpanzee is going to kind of depend on this confluence of factors. Um, there's no math in this. Right? Like I have not specified a mathematical formulation for this, uh, but you can think of it as basically being, you know, you have a weighted sets of, sets of constraints that push you and pull you towards shorter and longer terms, only one of which of those is actually related to, you know, the probabilistic processes that uh, support lexical selection. So how did we look at this? Well, we had a two alternative rating task in which I showed people 380 sentences. Participants actually only got 38 of these, um, because it, you would see the same word multiple times and then you would start getting all stressed out. So imagine you have a sentence like a major, a majority of the blockbuster movies are produced in the US, right? Sounds better with US, right? But somebody could say United States and you'd be like, sure, okay, you're like being American today. Um, so the we have a whole bunch of sentences like that. Some of them are biased a little bit more toward US and some of them are biased a little bit more toward United States. Um, and we, we basically said, which of these two words sounds better to you in context? Do you like US or do you like United States? We then uh, did some math. So I trained a classifier, I can talk about this later, uh, to predict participants' ratings. And this gives me a number that corresponds to the probability that participants liked the shorter or the longer word. So some of these sentences, like a majority of blockbuster movies are produced in the US, there's lots of reasons that you might think US would work well here, right? Like in the UK, in the US, in the, I don't know, UAE, right? Like you're not gonna say like a full country name in this particular context. So the US is a much more fluent choice. You'll, you'll pick that more often. Um, now this classifier uh, is actually not like looking at any of the, any of the words that I'm actually showing you. I'm not saying give, tell me US versus United States. I'm just saying, do you think a shorter or a longer word would work better in this context, right? And so um, for that, uh, we can basically take those probabilities and correlate those with human ratings. Um, for the items that basically, we're just looking at generalization. So first of all, I wanted to show you the reassuring pattern that um, one of the biggest intuitive things you would imagine is that if you're being hoity-toity, right? And you're saying a lot more low frequency words, you're going to prefer to say a longer word, right? Like chimpanzee works better if you're a primatologist who is hypothesizing that the species of chimpanzee in some particular region does something interesting of some kind. But then if you're just like, oh, my favorite animal is chimp, like it's the chimp, right? Like, you know, you could do that. Um, so uh, we show that uh, higher frequency words that contain, sentences that contain higher frequency words are typically uh, better with a, well, the shorter word. People like to say the shorter word, which is not always less frequent uh, or more frequent, um, but it is usually a little bit more frequent. Likewise, if a sentence contains a lot of like hoity-toity language, then people are gonna tend to prefer the longer word. But what's really interesting about this study is that if we try and use the whole context to predict people's preferences, in our laboratory study, the more something should ordinarily take any kind of longer word, the more likely participants actually prefer the longer word in that sentence. Um, what was really surprising to me is that a model that took my participants' preferences in this task also generally generalized really well to corpora. So if you look at people's preferences, in terms of what they actually said uh, in like POCA, uh, people produce more or less high frequency words uh, or sort of like long words go in the same kinds of context as long words and short words go in the same kinds of context as short words. So people have an intuitive but also continuous kind of knowledge of this, um, uh, of this range of, of choices that they can make. I did not even attempt to plot the effect of surprisal here, which is the thing that everybody else would have said is clearly more important if it's about predictability, because there isn't an effective surprise. Um, the predictability of the word US or the predictability of the word United States doesn't seem to influence uh, people's decisions in these, in these tasks. Um, I don't know if that's a just a difference in the kind of stimuli that I built relative to the study that I was basing this off or, or what, but I think that the main conclusion that I wanna uh, have you take home today 
is that context really strongly constrains production. Um, and it constrains it in this kind of stylistic or discourse level way, right? Where there's some kind of pressure that we have to make the words that we want to say sound like the other words that we have to say. So um, not only is it the case that we like to match stylistically the words that we're going to use, but it also seems to play a much bigger role than just like frequency, right? We're not just picking words that are much more frequent. Um, and so I, I, I'm very, very curious about ways that this might have uh, arisen just from, you know, intuitive uh, stimulus generation rather than, um, anyway, I will try not to say so many bad things about them. Um, okay. So now we're back. Now we're back to the buggy, right? We talked about infinite and infinite possible sentences. How do you stop? How do you know to not produce all kinds of? How do you know? I'm just going to say one more word, right? How am I going to say? What kind of words am I going to say? How do I pick between rabbit and bunny, right? In the end, like, what's the way that I actually decide? Um, you have to figure out what the alternatives are somehow. Um, and so uh, I have two studies that I'm going to be looking at here. One of them is going to be looking at whether uh, what we're doing when we pick between two alternatives, one of which might be like less accurate or truthful about what we want to actually convey. And then the other one is going to be about how do we just kind of, in a sort of colloquial context, you're trying to guess what your friend is going to say. Like, how do I pick what kinds of words that my friend might say? And how does... Um, how does the uncertainty that I have about what those words might be manifest? So here's kind of more what I mean. The production system has to basically constrain this bunny picture. And if your goal is just, just produce one word, right? You still have to take this really, really large conceptual space and funnel it down. You have to winnow it down into a single option. The production system cannot, you cannot articulate multiple words at the same time. It's just like the motor system will not let you do this. Um, would be really cool if you could do it. Uh, sadly, uh, you can only say one thing. And so what we have to do is lay out all of our alternatives, right? And I don't know necessarily how many alternatives we have to choose between, but we do know that the alternatives that we have actually really strongly shape uh, our processing fluency. So like if a word sounds like a lot of other words, like let's say that I've just said the word beach, and then you have to say the word beat, right? Um, you're going to be slower to say the word beat after hearing beach than after hearing like banana or something like that. Um, because the phonological overlap kind of changes uh, how you have access to different words in your knowledge. So this, this uh, variability, uh, we want to make sure we understand how alternatives are selected between because it's a really, really, really computationally difficult problem. Uh, so I wanted to talk to you about a study that we did where we tried to model uh, why people seem to say things that aren't what they mean. So let's say you're navigating, okay, so Salt Lake City's on a grid, right? So if you say go north, you know, you can go north. If you say go toward the mountains, probably people mean these, right? But maybe you're a jerk and you mean the other ones, right? Like, so if you say go toward the mountains, you might want to be more specific. Um, you could also say go northwest, right? And maybe you could say go northwest, but you could also say go north, oh, and also go west, right? Uh, or maybe somebody has to clarify. If you live in Madison, Wisconsin, which is structured as an isthmus uh, that's actually sort of crooked, if you say go east, you actually mean go northeast because of the structure of that isthmus, um, which is really, really, uh, really confusing because actually what you end up with is a map that's slightly crooked, so that if you live in Madison long enough, your northeast is actually basically east. Um, this is really confusing for people who aren't from there, because if you tell somebody to go east, they don't actually go in the right direction. So there was an, there was an original study uh, by Mark Carandas, Mark, Martin Satterson, and my former postdoc advisor, Mary Ellen McDonald, who basically trained people on novel compass terms and got them to uh, basically get all of the words are perfect. They, they remember all of the words perfectly well, absolutely completely accurate. And then they give them ones that they have a time pressure to convey a direction in which this kind of fake elf has to go. Um, so there are these little like imaginary elves and they're told type the word that they have to, the direction that they have to go in as fast as you can. But it turns out that when you give them 
uh, a low frequency word like PEM, uh, one of these blue ones, um, they are much more likely to use a higher frequency term like moon or blitz than the other way around. So for example, let's look at this here. Um, if the nearest word that people have is high frequency, so these like purple ones, they're mostly going to say the high frequency word. Like you're just going to say north when you mean north, right? You're not really going to say northwest when you mean north. But if you mean northwest, you're much more likely to say north than you would the other way around, right? You're still going to mostly say northwest, but there's a really good chance that you're going to produce the word north. And we were like, well, this is really annoying if you're trying to navigate somebody across the universe. So uh, why might this happen, actually? So they actually argued that people are basically doing the wrong thing here. They're not taking into account like the difficulty of navigating the space. These poor elves are being left to you know, wander in some wasteland, and they can never make it to their destination. But it turns out you can actually model this using the Rational Speech Act model. And I promise this looks scarier than it is, so I'm going to walk you through it. Um, let's say that you are uh taking everything 100 literally right and your goal is like you hear the word pin and you know the pin is associated with this one particular direction and you're an elf and you're trying to navigate the space um you know that this angle is 100 pin like it can't be any other angle right when you hear the word pin uh you're gonna do some computation that says like is this true or false right say um if i know that you are going to take the word like true or false based on the angle like this part's easy it's just the probability of the angle given the label uh, and if it's at the exact location that's the 100 of the time right there's like some variation around that angle um maybe you know if it's like kind of in between pin and blit or pin and and hoon or whatever like those are going to be kind of you know you're not going to be 100 percent sure but you can still be pretty confident um the thing that makes this model interesting is actually we, we argue that you don't even have to really do that much like fancy reasoning in order to capture the effects that we see in the earlier study. So let's say that you're just modeling like somebody who is processing what you say literally, right? That's this, this section here. We're going to say that this is the probability that the listener goes in the right direction, right? Um, like if you hear him and it's kind of a little bit in the blit direction, like, are you still going to kind of go in the right direction? Some of these are harder than others, though, right? Like, like you saw here in the earlier slide, the high frequency words get co they come out as high frequency words, but low frequency words are much more likely to come out as high frequency words, right? What if it's just because they're harder to say, right? Like in the, in the actual experiment, they manipulated the frequencies of these to be four times as frequent, the high frequency ones as the low frequency ones. And so even though large participants knew all of them by heart, right? Some of them are still going to take more time because they had to produce them less. And so it turns out that if you add like a little cost associated with the difficulty of these high frequency words, people are very, very likely to do the exact same thing in the model. So what we see is that high frequency words get produced as high frequency words and low frequency words mostly get produced. we're able to capture the empirical data in the original study, which is really, really cool. There's some extra simulation data in this. That if you get uh, bored and you want to check out the OSS or the, the GitHub page for this, um, we also find that it matters which of the neighbors you're close to. So like if you're a low frequency word and you're next to two high frequency words, that's different than if you're a low frequency word between two high frequency words, right? Um, so like these two blue guides over here, are treated really differently from this blue guy on this side, right? Just because they have different, um, they have really different neighbors. So this is really neat. Um, it suggests that language language production might look like it's not suboptimal, and it might look like you're not taking into account what the other person is going to say, but it actually kind of reflects a Bayesian trade-off. So people are really sensitive to how difficult something is to say, and then some of the time you're not going to retrieve the word in time. You're going to get the higher frequency word. Um, so we wanted to actually kind of expand on this at some point, um, some point soon. Uh, sadly, uh, Robert fucking moved to Stanford. And so like the slightly delayed uh, further collaboration and stuff. But once he like has a life again, 
uh, I promise that we're going to look at time pressure, like increase the time pressure, decrease the time pressure, and see how this matters. We know that time pressure is a really big component on, in terms of what biases people have toward familiar versus unfamiliar words. Um, we also want to look at how whether comprehenders are actually okay at this. Like if somebody tells you go northwest, you're like going to go northwest. But if somebody tells you to go north and you know that it's actually kind of northwest, like will you still go in mostly the right direction? Unclear. And it's an empirical question, I think. Um, and that allows us to actually fl to flesh out how much knowledge listeners have about how much producers might not actually say what they mean. Um, okay. Uh, am I doing okay on time? Okay. I'm gonna say things slower. I'm gonna read each word out loud real slow. Um, okay. So, okay, I talked a little bit about neighbors, but like, what do we mean by neighbors? This is the this section of the talk is what do we mean by neighbors? So, this is a different kind of context in which uh, the production that you're doing is a little bit to uh, predict what someone else is going to say. And I know that this varies cross-culturally, right? So like if you're from New York City, you're probably much more inclined to interrupt somebody. But if you're from, you know, like Nebraska, you might wait your turn until they're done talking, right? Different parts of the parts of the world are more or less interrupty and different, you know, different types of people are more or less interrupty. I know that I often try to complete other people's sentences and I might get on your nerves and I'm really sorry if it is the case that I do that, but it's something that we do often enough that it's worth understanding how it happens. So this is really similar to a laboratory task that we use um, to understand linguistic predictability called the closed task. So um, we're going to try and understand what actually happens uh, when you have to predict what else someone might say. Are you going to get the right thing? Are you going to be slower in cases where there's more uncertainty? Uh, does it matter what the structure of what others are going to say is in terms of how well or how readily you'll guess what they're going to say? So let's say you have the sentence, friends are always able to finish each other's. But then there's the funny version of this, which is sandwiches. Yeah, some of y'all have seen this before. So it's really fun. To, it's fun to finish each other's sandwiches, right? Um, and this one's great because sentences and sandwiches kind of sound similar. They have very similar exotic structure. One of these is way lower probability than others. Um, this kind of closed task, we have people give answers to, you know, fill in these sentences for a wide variety of uh, contexts. And we're going to see what kinds of guesses people make in these types of tasks. So what kinds of, kinds of guesses are they saying? And we're going to look at this under the context of two different theories in language production. The first, of one, the first one states that language production has this competitive selection process. So I have a whole bunch of options in front of me, and I have to pick the best one. And, the, and not only do I have to pick the best one, like imagine like it's like a bucket full of kittens, and they're all kind of moving around, and like some of them are climbing to get on top of each other, right? A competitive selection is like this kitten who's on the top, like maybe crawling all, over all the other kittens, and you're trying to take him out of the bucket. Like he's competing with the other kittens, right? But imagine they're all napping. Right, like maybe they're all just hanging out, they're not moving, they're not doing anything else. That would be non-competitive. You can just pick whichever kitten you want, right? And maybe it's the one that has like the spots on it and you really like it. Those are the two kinds of theories. There's a competitive theory for, in which the kittens are actively trying to get your attention versus a non-competitive theory in which they're basically all sleeping. On a lexical level, this basically means that some words might actually try and steal activation from other words. Um, so this would mean that a really common word that you might want to say is actually a little bit harder to produce than you would expect. Um, and if it's non-competitive, then basically it's just as easy to produce as you expect. Um, so we're going to look at this in, in terms of probabilities. Um, and we're going to especially look at this in terms of uh, semantic structure. So we use this task that's an in incremental closed task, uh, which is just like the sandwiches example, uh, except we have people do this for all of the words in a sentence. So um, if any of you have ever seen the stimuli, because maybe you've gone to like Brennan Payne's lab meetings or something like that, you might know this sentence, but like humor me. Let's try and finish this. Okay, a night the... No, you, nobody, any, any guesses? Uh, what? Children's. Oh, children is a good one. But no, a night the old? Maybe. Yeah, woman locked the. Yeah, or any number of things. 
So you can lock doors, you can lock windows, you could lock safes. Um, we get all those kinds of answers from people. And then what I did was I was like, well, uh, we still don't know what the competitors are because some of these sentences, like uh, at night, the, right? There's a really wide variety of options that you could say here. Like you might wanna go in the direction of like adjectives. You might go in the direction of nouns. You might go in the direction of like animate nouns or inanimate nouns. Maybe within the animate nouns, you might have like human beings versus animals, right? Like the wolves versus the like children, right? Um, so some of these cases have way more variety and we want to kind of organize those in ways that are useful. So we clustered participant responses um, using, uh, I'm not going to get too much into the math or anything here, a modeling framework called the, like a Bayesian and Gaussian mixture modeling algorithm. And basically all this does is it says, okay, well, words like face and nose and ears and eyes and stuff are all in the same category um, on the basis of the fact that they tend to occur in similar linguistic contexts. Um, and so maybe that's the way that we can define a competitor. Like words that occur in the same category are competitors and words that occur in different categories are not. The one thing that I like about this approach, um, we use large language models for this, but don't worry, it's not as, it's not as GPT as, as you might imagine. Um, the thing that's cool about this is we can actually say, okay, well, not only are these things in the same part of speech most of the time, they're also really paradigmatically similar, right? They really are sitting in the same kinds of general like semantic directions. Um, we got ratings of that similarity, actually. People mostly think that these are very coherent at like a paradigmatic level. They're also really syntactically coherent, like something like 85% of the clusters that my model learns are all the same part of speech. Um, so it's really, really nice. And now we have a definition of competitor. So knee and head, those compete. Uh, likewise, hands and foot, compete, right? They're, they're really similar words. Um, and it's a data-driven way of doing this. So we don't actually even have to, you know, have RAs sit down and say like, okay, well, hands and noses and feet and stuff like that are all in the same category. Let me visualize this for you a little bit. So we clustered them. I co colored these to kind of indicate uh, that these things belong to different categories. And some of them, you know, look like they're kind of touching a little bit, and that's because it's a little noisy, and there's a lot of variability. But there's this dark blue cluster, and a light blue cluster, and then there's like a couple of little red dots, and a green cluster, and a yellow cluster, right? And if I show you these two blue dots, right, these two words are competitors. Um, these two words will compete with each other, even though they're, you know, sort of far apart. But this yellow guy over here, like these yellow guys, those are totally different clusters, right? Those are not, like, why would you say that this word competes with this word? You know, they're, they're just really totally different kinds of words. Um, and if they are competitors, then words that are in the same cluster should hurt each other in uh, production speeds, basically. So I'm going to show you that there's some, some really cool evidence for this. Um, so I'm going to orient you to the plot. You're going to see on the x-axis, we're just going to look at the word probabilities, right? So we expect that words that are really common, like a night the old woman locked the door, like door is really, really probable. So it's like, 90% of people's guesses. And then there's like 5% is doors plural. And then like, you know, 3% is like some, some of the other words and so on, right? Um, on the x-axis, we're gonna plot the probability of an individual word. And on the y-axis, I'm gonna plot the reaction time to naming and providing the answer in this task. Um, and what I want you to imagine is that, first of all, those lines should go down right? Like in general, like you're faster because you have something that's really easy. It's really probable. I'm going to plot two lines. One of them is like, there's no competitors. Uh, and so those will be just like, if you just had every word was in its own category, basically. Um, and the other one will be if there are uh, competitors in a category. And what we see is that when competitors are absent, this like dotted line, reaction times are generally much, much slower or much, much higher, faster than when there are competitors, the solid line. Um, and more interestingly to me, I think, is actually that this shows up most for the really common ones. So this is cases when like, let's say that you have something that's like 10% um, and you have another word that's uh, another 10% in the same category versus 10% uh, in another category, right? This is kind of what this represents. So that when the two words are 10% in like different categories, you're much faster than if you had two words that were 10% in the same category. Um, 
So the cool thing about this is that it shows that there's a kind of cost. Um, more probable words are faster to say, but if there's a competitor, it's, you know, there's a bit of a cost that you have to pay. And so uh, I find this really, really interesting because it suggests that this clustering model is picking up on really relevant structure to the, the naming data that we're getting. So I'll summarize this real quick, um, which is that, first of all, we don't always say exactly what we, mean, what, what, what we mean, but it might just be because it's easier to say something else. Um, and then uh, we know that it's easy to say words that are probable in general. So higher frequency words, more probable words. Um, and also what we say is going to be a little bit harder if there's other ways to say it. Uh, so we're going to say, you know, Northwest less often than we might. Uh, and likewise, we might pick to say, we might choose to say, you know, um, we might be slowed down by having to say a word like feet uh, when the word hands is an equally probable option. So um, now we know a bunch about language production, but we still don't know how it happens, right? So I wanted to try and define a model of production in this task just to kind of get a little bit closer, right? Um, we have an, a really, really, really large probable, uh, oh, I have 10 minutes? Okay, excellent. I, I'm on time. I think I, think I can do that. Um, we have like no bounds on what we could say about this picture. And not only that, uh, if any of you have been lectured about the Gavagai problem in uh, language processing, if, if you were like just hanging out and you saw an alien and you named this picture and you said Gavagai, you would probably as a human being say it's a bunny, right? But if you were a jerk or a philosophy major or something, and some of us are, no, like you might be like, it could be this plant, it could be the greenness, it could be like that the vibe was off, like it could be anything, right? There could be so many different things that this picture signifies. Um, and the fact that we have to narrow that down, right? There, there are major constraints on production, right? And it's not just the, you know, from comprehender's point of view, you have to figure out what somebody's saying, but you actually have to say, oh, okay, well, I have to communicate ideas. So how do you do it? Well, you probably do it in a kind of, you, you probably need to do it in a kind of cheap way because we have to talk a lot. So the production algorithm that we propose uh, for any production algorithm has to be efficient. Um, if you're familiar with any of these like large language model things, they're slow as heck, right? Like they take forever. And like these engineers whose like whole job is to optimize computing systems, if you're ever plugging anything into chat GPT or Gemini or whatever, right? It takes a while. Um, that latency is despite all the work that those engineers have done. People can produce answers, maybe still also bullshit, right? Reasonably quickly. Um, we also know that neighborhood structure matters, right? So we need to incorporate neighborhood structure somehow into our model. Uh, what, what is that gonna look like? Maybe it's gonna be this kind of geometric space sort of guy. And then we also wanna have some degree of episodic knowledge. So like I showed you earlier, it's clear that there's some degree of individual memory that matters for just using language, right? Like I have to remember what other people say. I have to be able to come up with um, language that other people have used because they want to understand me using familiar terms. So like if we look at this plot a little bit, I, I dare you to ponder the abyss, right? Each of these individual dots kind of represents like one memory, right? You can think of each of them as an exemplar in this model. Uh, now, in this particular case, these are derived from like large language model inputs and they're not time like I had indicated earlier, but they still kind of represent one memory of each of these categories, for each of these words in these categories. An efficient production system might not sample this whole space, right? Like you might not be like, oh, I'm just gonna drop a pin and then like search through all of the dots in my whole memory to find the thing that I'm looking for, right? That would take a really long time. If you had to search through your whole memory to figure out what to say, you would get slower and slower and slower until you die, right? And, and we do, but not that way. Um, so maybe we actually select within categories and within those categories, then we look for memories that belong to those categories. So imagine now uh, we could sample over this space uh, and ideally look in between you know, each of the points in space that we're at and compare these memories to some target that we're aiming for. So if I'm trying to say words like bunny, right, I'm gonna end up in like some kind of animal cluster that I have some probability of sampling. And then within that animal cluster, bunny has some number of memories that I have 
of it, and it's going to be sampled to some percentage of the time. Um, this narrows down our memory from not just like 60,000 words or however many words you think college students and, and everybody else in the whole world knows, but you know, maybe more like 10 or 20. Um, the sub network kind of approach allows us to compress the number of options that people have to produce. And so this basically massively cuts the number of sort of, uh, if you've ever tried to find something in a drawer that has too much stuff, right? If you're trying to find something specific, you know that if you had a drawer organizer, it would be easier, right? And if you use the drawer organizer, it's going to be easier still, right? So basically what we're just trying to say is that there's some degree of clustering, these kind of like a, a management system for your memory that allows you to get that. Then let, just like with this drawer management issue, you are also going to get confused over which necklace is which or which earrings are which, right? That competition that we see in these networks also comes for free because you have to pick between two of the same necklace or whatever in, in this drawer. So the fact that we see competition automatically happens if you have to select a subspace because those two words come from the same cluster. This changes the probabilities of those words, right? The probability of banana or rabbit or anything in this whole space is much lower than the probability of banana in this space, right? Um, and likewise, the com competitors are much more active in this space than they are in the whole space. So that's kind of the high level, high level proposal. Um, this also kind of has some interesting uh, connections to uh, some more recent work on how people are able to do like sentence comprehension so efficiently. I actually don't like this paper because what they propose is actually more complex than the naive implementation, but it's it's still really interesting as a proposal. Um, but it is also, it's a bit more like what we know how episodic memory search and semantic memory search work. Um, so some people actually think of it as a kind of analogous to how squirrels and crows and things like that go through all of their hit, like cache sites for the stuff that they store over the winter, right? They kind of do this in an optimal way. So uh, people might kind of do something similar when they're searching for a word to say. Um, okay, so conclusions. Uh, I think that we balance a really wide variety of constraints. So statistical properties, contextual properties, uh, as well as you know, we have to pick between words, right? How do we do that? Well, we use all kinds of sources of knowledge. Um, are the alternatives really matter? And sadly, uh, what I'm describing to you now is a schematic or a general proposal, but I think it would be really great if I had you know, a moment to sit down and write this out in terms of the actual formulas, multiplications of probabilities, basically. This is a really efficient model relative to some of the other ones that have been proposed. And I think um, I would like to be able to test whether these types of proposals are true kind of going forward. So with that, I think I'm at time. So I would like to thank the the lab um, that uh, my uh, the language processing and computation lab listened to a practice talk in which I was much more confident than I am today. Uh, thank you all for humoring me for it. Members of the Calico lab who heard my early Gaussian mixture model nonsense and how uh, how this ended up becoming a big project. All of my collaborators as well as the National Science Foundation that funded some of this work. Um, so thank you. I also have bonus slides if anybody wants to get into the weeds, but I'm also happy to not get into the weeds and we can just pontificate uh, whatever works with y'all. Are there questions from Zoom? Zoom people can ans ask questions. Okay. A heck of them. Um, hi, hi. Oh, more of a question people on the Zoom. Oh, okay. You're, you have the mic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, great. Um, okay. Excellent. Yes. Uh, I believe Caleb, you are. Okay. Yes. Um, I, was, I was thinking about this idea at the end of the modeling about going to the clusters. Mm -hmm. And in terms of, like, it seems like the motivation for the artist is, is making the selection among the competitors fast enough. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering if. Maybe another potential mechanism would be something that's more of a heuristic than an mm -hmm. optimal search. Mm -hmm. um, I like I mean, I was introspecting that on how I like when I'm writing uh -huh. first draft in particular. Like, yeah. I'll often if I'm trying to come up with the next word, I'll I can like actually consciously feel myself 
like sorting through the options and all I basically just don't come across one that works well enough. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then I stop at that. Yeah, yeah. I don't necessarily go to a dictionary and like a ball hop will work in it and then choose the one that I think is best. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Yeah. Speech. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so the, I wanted to first like vibe on the good enough part, which is that that's actually one of the biggest motivations for this earlier work is that people's selection of high frequency words or familiar terms or maybe because you don't really know for sure what you want to say, but you know kind of generally the space you want to end up in. That's kind of the, the high level thing. I think people do good enough production all the time. Um, so I, I think there's empirical evidence for the sort of subjective experience you have with, with writing. Um, there's something very interesting as another aside, which is that people are always complaining about written language production as not being representative of language production um, because it's not a real task. Like it's not it's not just like but it's like people belabor word choice in these contexts right and so I think if anything written production is a really good instance of cases where you have full control over the message that you ultimately produce um, and you're you're relying a little bit less on heuristics but you still might have constraints like I personally don't want to wait on myself until I have resolved this right sometimes it's more important to get words on a piece of paper um, the second. Uh, the sorting algorithm that you're kind of describing, or like the fact that you have some set of candidates that you're considering and you're going through them each kind of in order, I found sort of evocative because there's probably a whole bunch of stuff you already ruled out. Uh, and that's kind of the space that I find interesting, right? Like, so let's say that you have, um, you're trying to decide between like furthermore and like accordingly, right? And um, you have, uh, you know that neither of those is great, that they're not stuck together. There's probably some other ones that are like just a little bit lower probability and you can't quite retrieve those. Um, but then there's all kinds of words like pizza that you have already, like you are not going to say. Figuring out the sort of where people start in this search process is really unclear to me, but it seems to me that people are narrowing things down at least to some broader so maybe constructions or uh, phrases or something like that that have a certain set of properties that they can use to kind of filter through the space um one concern that i have about the existing models is not so much that people are considering all options so much as that they, all the options that people are considering are probably much smaller in number than the full set of all of the things you could say. Um, and part of the reason that this is the case is, well, part of the reason that I would like to argue for this is that at least in spoken production, and I think uh, probably also signed production, right? So spontaneous language production, um, people's production is extremely implemented, like mine just now, right? Like, so people do not know always exactly how they want to say things. Um, and the fact that we don't always know exactly how we want to say things I think really raises the question of like, how could you possibly be computing infinite numbers of options? Um, probably the hard part is this filtering thing ahead of time. Okay. Formulating the form of the message. The computer scientist in me is just screaming at this is how I took the fashion. Yeah. It's like, That's have cool. a semantic representation and it matches right to the bottom of it and then magically filters everything out. Yeah, it's searching. Okay. Heuristically, within that bucket. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that that's reasonable. I think that uh, at least on vibe wise, it feels very similar. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, some of the way that I've been thinking about this is actually that each of these categories has a particular probability, and then you sample within each of those categories. So, I don't know, maybe thirty percent of the time I pick um, in a closed task, you know, uh, I think it's going to go in the noun direction, and then thirty percent of the time it's in the verb direction. You know, once I'm in the verb cluster, then I look at all the verbs that are there. Um, and I guess, depending on the coding scheme, you could get something like that for free. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, basically, I mean, basically, I am arguing like implicitly for compression, um, which I think is a really, really neat way of thinking about this. Um, and then sparsity is also a really important component to this. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, All right, you find me in the back. 
Yeah. Um, I have a question kind of about the effect you find with directionality in those idiomatic phrase structures. Oh, yeah. So, with my understanding of the argument that you're making is that if you have an instance of one half of the phrase structure, if there is enough of a strong enough like, association between the two over time, then you're going to link them together. So, if in the example, like the idiomatic phrase extra credit, would you predict that there would be a difference in? credit triggering extra than extra triggering credit. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah, so I get I get this question a lot and I really love this question. I wish that I hadn't controlled for stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So these are exactly the kinds of cases where I tried to minimize the association in both directions um, and the productivity of the words. Um, but in, the, in doing so, I confounded the kind of mutual informativity of the words that are in the phrases that I used. Um, it was the case for some items that some of them did seem to go in one direction over the other. Um, they're adjective noun phrases, and so there's a slight noun bias in remembering these phrases. So people are a bit better at remembering credit than they are at extra. Um, the nouns are a little bit more distinctive than the adjectives, too, which is part of it. Um, the adjectives are usually a little bit less frequent, but uh, the completion probability sort of work that exists. Um, for transition probabilities and phonetic duration is a huge component. All right. So like just like the way that you produced extra credit, right? Like the word is a little bit shorter um, in the credit direction, uh, where credit is a little bit shorter than it would be in other cases, right? Oh, oh, like credit where credit is due, right? Those are much less reduced than cases where it's a collocation. Um, I think it's probably spontaneous. Production, there probably is a little bit more of this incrementality that kind of fits a little bit with this earlier or this more more like later proposal. Um, whether there are clear mechanisms for this yet uh, within like the modeling literature, I haven't seen anything come out since then. Um, but I think that it would be straightforward to modify this like kind of big circles and lines version with asymmetric connections. Um, so adding you know forward and backward association terms which we know actually is really important in the semantic memory search space, uh, that certain terms trigger other terms, but not in the other direction. Um, usually like things like thematic association, like jungle will trigger like different kinds of animals, but like animals don't necessarily trigger the word jungle, so on. Yeah, no, that's a really cool question. I love getting that. I love being reminded about that. It makes me happy. Um, um, I saw a statement that I really liked um, in seeing the model explaining why when you learn more words and get more experiences, why you're not slowing down with more words to pick from. Yeah. In speech. So the sentence fluent production is supported by interconnections throughout the lexicon mm -hmm. and how that connects with going forward with more words and more experience. Um, I thought that was a really interesting explanation. I thought there would be really interesting implications for going backwards, such as learning a new language. Uh -huh. Maybe all of the words you have are, are they just in one bucket at a time? And is that why it's so hard to like pick which words you're using, uh, speaking language for the first time? Mm -hmm. How is the bucket made? Is there like a new cluster threshold? How to determine that? I think yeah. those are questions to be considered though. I have not done this work, but there is a really, uh, Okay, so the, the VP of Learning Sciences at Duolingo, before she became that person, Bojena Paya, uh, she had a paper looking at Bayesian hierarchical modeling of uh, L2 phonological acquisition that basically makes the same kind of argument that like part of it is you're using the knowledge that you have about your first language. And then only with exposure do you end up actually starting to say, no, actually the separate context, this language that I am learning uh, becomes a new category. Um, and it sort of uh, appropriates the same arguments as like, well, some people pronounce B's and P's a particular way that's unique to them. And then other people pronounce B's and P's like in a slightly different way. Uh, maybe some of this is mediated by like hierarchical properties like dialect or gender and things like that. Um, but yeah, exactly. So that was a really, really cool paper. I definitely recommend you read it. Um, I think it's Payak, Kleinschmidt, Fein, and Jaeger maybe. Um, it's like the classic combo of those folks from that point in time um, out of that lab. But it's a really, really cool. Yeah, it's like hierarchical Bayesian. Um, like language acquisition or something like that. Yeah. 
very, very cool. Um, yeah, it's a shame she had to go make money. <laughs> like, because I would love to see more follow-ups on that work because I haven't seen anybody doing doing work on that uh, in that framework. Uh, and also maybe Shin Shi, um, like at uh, UC Irvine, she does some of this, but in L2 uh, phonological category acquisition and adaptation. Um, I think kind of similar lines. She did her work with Chugusa, Kromata, and Florian Yeager, as, as one might imagine. Yeah, of course. Annie, I see you over there. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I was just reading because I didn't see anybody else. <laughs> I have no problem. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> um, first of all, thank you for the talk. Um, so I have two questions about section two. Okay. Kind of the role of the music context. Yeah. Uh, which I find really neat and also really, really. Um, uh, like in a way, very surprising and also intellectually satisfying. Okay. Respect. Cool. Um, so I have a more detailed question about the sort of methodologies. Ah. I'm uh, just in a way. So I was wondering about how the sentences are kind of like ah. uh, disrupted, just in a way that, uh, and and also, can you show me the plot um, of the kind of the decreasing line with the back? The medium long frequency. Oh yeah, 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 that's this one. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So specifically for this one, I was wondering whether have you teased apart different types of words, um, and then look at how different types of words, the the log frequency of different types of words could affect um the ah uh, yeah yeah long word. For example, I put uh one 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 thing that I put uh, I I think my be intuitively making sense is the difference between function words versus counter words. Yeah. Um, and whether you think that this approach is even, or, mm -hmm. or thinking in this line is even. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, right. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So, so like the question is kind of like how much does this general context effect kind of generalize to selection? Right. So, um, part of the, uh, let me sort of zoom out uh, uh, eventually. Uh, so first, the study is um, focused on words that have these alternations, like info information and chimp chimpanzee. So they're sort of phonologically and morphologically structured in sort of related ways. Um, there's actually several different kinds of reduction processes that happened with these that I thought was really interesting. Uh, we stuck with these because these were the kinds of words that were used in the study that we based stars off of. Um, it's not clear to me that this is something that would work well at like the alternation level for any other kinds of, so in terms of alternations, I think that this uh, is very, you know, uh, I think that these data would extend reasonably well to all kinds of other alternation data, right? So if you had to choose between words that were longer and words that were shorter, which could mean things like phonetic, Duration, right? So that in certain cases, when you're trying to be hoity toity, you might hyper articulate and like make all the segments slightly longer and more em emphasize them relative to the others. Um, zooming a little bit further out with like other kinds of words in general, um, the information theory bros, I think, would all kind of argue that the probabilities of these words. Are the thing that make them shorter, right? So, like, in is a short word because it's frequent and because it's predictable. Um, whereas, into is conveying a more complex idea and therefore has to be longer. Um, and it's a... okay. But I think, like, on a purely functional, um, I, I, I think that the context effects that I'm interested in here are mostly at the content level um, because those are the ones that I think are uh, the ones that we have the most conscious control over in stylistic kind of decision-making. Um, so when we're writing grants versus like text to friends and things like that, certain kinds of words are available to us because those are appropriate for the context. Um, on the other hand, we also know that these genres differ in the kinds of other function words and things like that used, right? So like uh, academic language uses many other kinds of words that are not used in everyday conversations. So like 
I always feel really pretentious when I go back home and talk to family and stuff because I've spent a lot of my spare time talking with other professors, right? And so I, I used really different language that is a lot more formal than I think like my sister uses in her everyday life. Um, so there's structural differences that I think probably do, you know, like uh, function content word differences that would also probably show up. Um, I have not figured out quite how to do it in an alternation framework. Like how do you define like in this chimp chimpanzee continuum, like where those exist? Um, but I have thought about doing this version where you just predict the, the length in like number of characters of the word that should go in that position. And I think you could get pretty close to like in, in actual corpora for that to work. The sentences themselves. Um, so they're, they're generally, there's the laboratory sentences that people are, I had a bunch of RAs sit down and try and make sentences that varied in um, some like content, right? So I think, um, and one of the ones they, they do these things, undergrads are very, they're very fun because they write things that other undergrads will read. <laughs> and so like they're asking, they have all these scenarios about like college context and like, oh, there was like some guy at the coffee shop and like some person that's like got the same name as one of their roommates, like, you know, went in and asked for, you know, some short version of a word. Uh, and, and I think that th those kinds of stimuli are not greatly representative of like the kinds of choices that people make. But the thing that I liked about this study with the corpus extension was that it suggests that they're picking up on some kind of universal regularities um, about how these kinds of words are used. I don't know if they would extend to all the same kinds of words. And I also don't know if this breaks down differently by the morphophonological reduction processes that are specific to these items. So like information, uh, info is like a clipping, right? Um, but then there's some that are kind of in the reverse. Um, I'm trying to remember a, a good example, but there's some that like you actually take the last syllable of instead of the first syllable. Um, and I'm not sure if I wish I could remember, but there, if you ever want to look at this, the OSF page uh, has all of the, um, where did I put it? Oh, did I not put this one? I meant to add a link for it. My The OSF page, which you can get to through my OSF page, has all the stimuli for these, including all the sentences that I used um, and the proportion data. Uh, so if you ever wanted to like look deeper into how those stimuli are constructed, that would be fantastic. Um, I technically can't show the COCA stimuli online because um, um, Mark, what's his face at BYU down the road, like like it's copyrighted <laughs> because he did all this work to like get permission to gather the data. So, um, but if you're interested in those, I do have those and I can share them too. I, I, I think I didn't make this oh. clear. Oh. Uh, oh, oh. Oh. oh, no, 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 we can talk later. Okay. No, no, no. We, have, we can have like one more question. No, go for it, I think. Um... No, 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 go ahead. It's nice for one. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone? I'm really sorry I misunderstood. <laughs> no, 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 I think it's me. No, I think it's me. I didn't make it clear. Oh. But I was wondering um, the the kind of example that I was thinking about, like function versus content words. I was maybe thinking about the kind of like block frequency of the other words. Oh, so yeah. Just in a way that, um, like, whether can we piece apart different kinds of linguistic contexts? Uh, and then how these different kinds of linguistic contacts will predict. Yeah. Would make predictions about the uh, alternatives. Right, right, right. Kinds of alternatives. Yeah, so wait, what, that, that's a really cool idea that I didn't, this actually reminds me, it's a synthesis that's really nice between this study with the directions and the chimp chimpanzee study, right? Because if there's effects of the other word and its frequency on the decision that you make, maybe it really is something about the competition in that particular context. Um, the closest I got was that I did look at the ratio of the conditional probabilities of the two words and that didn't do anything either. Um, but it could just be because these models are not good at sent, like in general, I think the conclusion is that large language models produce bad estimates of probabilities for constructed stimuli relative to corpus stimuli um, for reasons that are not obvious to me other than that people have abstractions in these models, abstractions are not quite aligned with those. Um, but uh, 
I would really like to actually like tease those apart a little bit more and, and see maybe if there are cases in that. Uh, if there's some degree of say competition or some degree of like, you know, relative fit of those two words in context, that would, that would be informative. Um, but yeah, I think uh, it's, um, it's really neat. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad you asked. Um, Um, uh, I mean, like, I think, like, Aniela has a lot of things to add, and I yeah. myself have a lot to add, but we can continue the conversations later. Uh -huh. And let's just, like, thank the speaker for our first. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thanks for having me.